Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, so I will be talking about the cases in open learning project that uh, took place uh, through the University of Cape Town. So this was a an, um, Department of Higher Education and Training project, funded project. And uh, so we were commissioned after we had sort of gone through the proposal uh, process. And so we were uh, granted the project. So with this project, um, there were three aims. No. There were three aims. And uh, the first one being um, to investigate the uptake of open learning in South African uh, PSET, which is the post-secondary education training uh, sector. And um, so looking at uh, open learning in terms of the DHET, which is removing um, barriers to learning. And so this is really looking at different ways uh, of removing these barriers, which is um, access to learning, recognition of credit of prior learning. So things like RPL and micro-credentials, uh, provision of learner support in different ways to enable success, expect and, and um, construction of learning programs that would enable success and maintenance of quality. And so in terms of this research, we then uh, had a number of institutions that we then had to research. So we had to produce case studies uh, with these initiatives that are taking place. So we had, uh, seven um, TVET colleges, six universities, two DHET, um, two, uh, two research projects were really focusing on the DHET and conducting people from there. And then we had one international one, which was actually a desktop study. And we had these um, 10 researchers who were recruited from all over uh, South Africa and they were then um, researching. And from there, we then also had to produce, so we had to curate, uh, produce uh, this research in the form of those 16 case studies. And um, so this also was to develop these researchers. And so um, one of the ways of dissemination was these researchers all presenting at this DHEAD colloquium that was organized in 2021. And so in that process as well, we had to prepare them for these presentations. And also these, the other outcome was then to also disseminate this research output in terms of booklets. And so for each case study, so these are the 16 case studies, each of the researchers had to uh, write up and then we also had, because now these were emerging researchers who were also focusing on the other part, which was actually producing the research-based chapter. And so we also had someone to sort of help them write in this different genre now in terms of uh, publishing for just a practice-based uh, sort of uh, booklet that other um, that TVET college lecturers and everyone could sort of make use of and understand easily. And so um, this was the, then the book that we then had uh, the editors, that was myself, Shanali, and Cheryl Hodgkinson Williams. And so each of those um, case studies were then also um, came chapters in this edited volume. And of course, because this is open uh, research and everything we're doing, we're doing openly. And so also in terms of the publication, we're making use of an open um, publisher. And then, um, so as I've said, the other strategy uh, or the other uh, requirement was to strengthen the research capacity of these researchers. And of course, this was um, a developmental project. So we had to recruit emerging researchers who had just completed their masters or their PhDs. And these had to come from designated um, employment equity groups. And so we managed to recruit um, 10 of them, which was from these groups. And of course, just also to note, they were coming from all different sorts of backgrounds. 
And so that was also a process for us to help them acquire the skills of researching, first of all, conducting educational research. And secondly, also now focusing on social science because people are coming from all different uh, disciplines. And um, so when we got this project, we then had to really think of what the focus is, which was in terms of working on those three areas that I have described. And then um, when we sort of got this project, we then had to, first of all, conceptualize what this open learning was about. And so, you know, with the background of UCT being, uh, having researched about open, of, uh, yes, having researched about open education, and now DHET was coming with this other concept, which was open learning. And so we had to spend some time trying to pull the two together and, uh, and, and understand this. And so we were, um, as the hub itself, and then also with the researchers, we had to sort of unpack all these aspects. And so really looking at what uh, open education provides and what it's really focusing on, which is mainly enabling access for people who didn't really get into the system. And so in terms of also enabling non-formal and informal um, education, whereas we then see that open learning is really those initiatives that are enabling learning or opening up learning, but that's mainly within these constrained formal education structures. And so also within this, um, we see that both of them are sort of driven by a social justice imperative. And then um, having also just looked at other uh, frameworks that could help us un uh, work and unpack this open, this uh, social justice, we then chose for the entire project, Nancy, Nancy Fraser's framework, which is looking at the three elements. And so, which is really looking at now these initiatives that are taking place in these various institutions in terms of how much they are enabling uh, participation of um, parity of participation. And so, which is really trying to understand what is happening in these institutions. And uh, so we had this bigger uh, question, which was sort of guiding everything that was taking place. And so people, would be then focusing in at the, the various uh, research areas and whatever element they are working with. So as you've seen those 16 uh, studies that were taking place and people having different uh, focus. And so um, as Jenny was saying, there's been a lot that we have learned through uh, the COVID and all that uh, restrictions and so on. So the, there was more of conceptualization in 2019 towards the end because the researchers were recruited in September. And then from there, they had to start off with writing their proposals for their topics or for the areas that they're going to be researching. And so that was also a process which took time where we had to um, allocate people mentors and then they had to work with their mentors to write up their proposals and then from there ethical clearance and so on. And then we had our first workshop in January, 2022, sorry, 2020, whereby we were now going to be discussing the various elements. And then from there, people were going to start collecting data and so on, but COVID hit. Uh, and so we had to move our stuff online. And, and of course, as I've mentioned earlier, that all these uh, researchers were from various institutions. We had only um, one PhD student who was based at UCT and was, so was living in Cape Town and all others were from various institutions. And so um, we had to now rethink everything and uh, how we're going to be moving the whole research process online. And so, um, we just also had this other uh, chapter where we were reflecting on the process, which we really see ourselves now as sort of working with this other right-hand side, the cold research phases. And of course, because of our nature of our research, 
which means that communication, the team building and administration, which was taking up most of um, sort of our time in terms of the research hub where we had our mentors and everyone at, uh, the, at, the, at UCT, at the Center for Innovation and Learning and Teaching where we were based. And so um, after they had written the proposals, we had to sort of work with them now in terms of, so which is uh, just a summary of what we've got on the table there. And so we then had to um, build this, uh, these teams so there could be a lot of collaboration and people could be moving from the same uh, point. And so we then had these cool Fridays where we would have two hours of discussions and seminars and so on. And we also had the reading circle where uh, people would then be starting to really understand and, and, and unpack uh, Fraser's uh, framework. And then, um, So as I mentioned that we had to conceptualize everything from uh, in a different way. And so we also had to be guiding them on how to navigate the uh, getting ethical clearance and so on. So from there, and then uh, during the research process, we also had to get the researchers to now consult the different institutions and so I think that's sorry. Okay. And then um, in these different sessions, we would have uh, sort of more of just discussing the whole research uh, process, and they would also be sharing. So even if at the beginning it was sort of more of a the hub sort of uh, in a teaching mode, but now they were also beginning to take some ownership and to share also their own uh, advice from different, from their own perspectives and experiences. And um, so it was much easier for those who are going to be collecting data from the TVET colleges because we got uh, permission from DHET and that was fine. But for those who are collecting from universities, then they had to be interacting with the universities to get ethical approval or, and also access to the participants. Um, and so throughout the whole process in the collection of data, they had to be supported. So for instance, uh, those were not computer literate and so they were supported in terms of that. Data analysis, we had a common analytical framework that we used and they were supported also in that. And of course, also quite a lot of work which went into the writing where we would have sessions and um, writing session, they will be sharing and, and mentors would be assisting them. And so just in summary, um, we had uh, about uh, 60, uh, 60 webinars where, uh, and all of these, of course, as I said, they were held online and we would be supporting the researchers. And also, as I've mentioned, we had six um, writing space, writing uh, sessions. And so really the lessons that we have learned in the process is that um, even if these were, were people who were, um, masters and PhD students or uh, graduates, but there was a lot of support that had to be put into that as we have already indicated. And so I think that's the main um, lesson and also really that spirit of, of working openly and collaboratively. So we were mainly using uh, the Google suite for all our processes. And of course, uh, we feel that we really need to be thinking about different ways now of, of really supporting and enhancing what we've learned from this process. So for instance, in terms of thinking about how you could be customizing these forms of support because we've got different researchers with different skill sets. Thanks. Thanks everybody. Um, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. and. Um, 
My name is Gino Franzman. I'm from Nelson Mandela University, and this is about the open education influences. This is also about being a member of GoGN for you know, the OG, so they say. And these are some of the events and pictures and people, and you'll see Fred and Rob and Bayer and people in the middle there, and yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Hey, someone. There we go. So just like um, I, I got nostalgic a bit earlier on, and I just wanted to also just reflect on the fact that you being part of this network means you are part of a family. And I'm here for the sake of advocacy, but also to let you know that there's a big world of open out there. And GoGN is a stepping stone into that world. So what I'm here today is to share some of the resources that myself and my team have made over the years of engaging, to invite you to use those resources, but then also to put out some real projects and activities and initiatives that are existent that I'm either collaborating in, coordinating in, or started or just participating in and inviting you to join the fun. So where's this thing? Why is it not going? Okay, so my connection with Doji N, I think, has, is pretty manifest by now. And we've had a lot of people saying like stuff, and you saw pictures where I looked like, yeah, something I'm not looking forward to repeating now. So, what are open ed influences? Well, this is a bit difficult here. You actually have to look there. Well, <laughs> there are ambassadors for open who energetically increase awareness of open education resources. Oh, look, I can do this. <laughs> um, and open education practices. OEs facilitate the adoption, creation, and licensing of OER. And they advocate for the use of open textbooks across faculties, purpose, and schools. So when I say purpose, I mean, we should stop looking at OER for higher education just because that's where some of us feel stuck or trapped, right? Open education is something that we should be looking at for professional development. And that's where I'm coming from. And that's why I created the Bowie course because the whole thing was about having been an advocate for open education for so long, trying to engage in the awareness raising space and discovering that the same question would very often stop a discussion from happening because someone would then ask what's an OER, yeah? So some of, some of what we do as open ed influencers, you see advocacy opening education, the hands touching there. We do lots of colloquia, we do lots of online events. Uh, I've had an online open education colloquium for yonks now. Um, Rob's been a frequent participant, um, many people in this room and in the network. And that's why I'm saying this is a family, right? When you need help, who do you call first? You call your family. Call us in, we can help you to enrich what you are doing. This is a network for a reason, not just so we can be in this room together, but that we can do this together. Um, I had an event in 2021 where a local satirist in South Africa called Conrad Koch came with his puppet, Chester Missing, and the two of them hosted the colloquium. When I say that you've never laughed so hard in the pursuit of opening up education, um, I can say that fully and honestly. So what's the course? The course is called Becoming an Open Education Influencer, right? Literally, Bowie. Please don't say B-O-E-I. It's just over. It's like, it's not G-O-G-N. Did it? So what's the course about? It's designed to help individuals who are passionate about wanting to help others. Um, you'll see that we've got six modules and the open module is there. So these are all created for this project, right? Using all resources that are out there, and putting them all into vehicles, highly assessed, all on Moodle, on an open Moodle site called Engage at Mandela University. It's available for each of you to access, to take the course, but more than that, if you want, you can take any one of these modules and repurpose for your context, okay? We specifically did this with an African flavor so that we have a global south perspective 
And this becoming an open education influencer is one of the resources out there that presents a global South voice. So the second module is Ubuntu. And I don't know if anyone knows what Ubuntu is here. Shout it out. Say again. <laughs> well, uh, Ubuntu is a South, well, is an African philosophy of, um, of sharing of community. I am because we are. Right. So what's what's more um, appropriate for open education than having a module on the social facets of being open? Third module is advocacy, because we need people to go out and tell others about what's there. But how do you tell others? And COVID meant that we needed to start speaking online much more than face to face. So the facilitation module looks at strategies and ways, methods, means of dealing with advocacy online and then in person. Influencing, why? Because very often as students, you're speaking up when you're speaking to a lecturer. How does a student tell a lecturer, hey, I saw this thing called open educational resources. Would you like to try it? Lecturers don't like to be suggested to. Right, they like to tell, like Kerry was saying, or someone said earlier on, um, at the end of it, it's like, oh, we fold the student up. Um, I think that we need to make a space to be folded up as well. We are never full, right? Except of rubbish, but that's another thing. And then obviously it, it, it exists in the, in the larger world. So the sustainable development goals situates all of this and open and all of these modules within a global context, because what do we need? We need to look beyond our little borders. Here's how you register. Um, you will have a copy of this. Click the link. Um, there's the course. Sign in with Google, please. Use a Gmail address. Um, the login key is Bowie2022. You see that? And you're in, done. Um, it's quite a rigorous course, <laughs> Rob, Rob helped us to set this up and we worked tirelessly through COVID with a team from all across the world and I'll show you like that facet of collaboration. Um, it's also available on mobile devices via Moodle, right? And the nice thing is, so I think Davis was saying that there's no access at the school where the, the lady was teaching, right? Well, if you download Bowie on Moodle here, and you finish the assessments, once you do come online, it will all update and your assessment uh, marks and everything will be there. Um, I need to say thank you to my dear friend, Andrew Thuo from Learning Experience Design at Nelson Mandela University for helping to make this. And my dear friend, Koshla Blanche for sitting with me throughout COVID in her pajamas and me in my pajamas in our respective homes and working through lockdown, okay? So reflections, tips, and lessons learned. And I think this is good because we've been doing this for a while. So let's look back. Biggest reflection. There are often a few misconceptions about open education that we experienced in our engagements as open ed influencers. These are maybe one, mostly like a combination of, of, of the following factors. So there were personal um, sort of fears, uh, misconceptions, misinformation, right? Free is bad, free is less. And you see this, people think that if I'm paying for something, so if I pay for a Springer publication, the published work needs to be of value. Very often it's not, like you're sitting there and you're thinking, what did I just read? right? In open education, if we are licensing things open, you can contribute to the value of that resource artifact. So a lesson that we learned, two lessons. Making open education resources has a cost. It's not free. We do not work for free. It would be lovely if I was like a Bill Gates type of guy, but no, I need to earn money, right? And our jobs are very rarely directly connected to open. So we don't get reward and recognition for this. And that needs to change. Energy and passion is not enough. Look at this energy, it doesn't work, right? Look at this passion, it doesn't work. Opening up needs support and this needs to be political will and funding. If your boss isn't helping you speak about opening up, who are you speaking to? So 
Step one was to collaborate widely, enable professional development and network building. And that's what we're doing now, right? Network building. I'm inviting you in. Look, this is just for Bowie. University of Massachusetts Amherst, Sarah Hutton is part of the network still, right? Yeah, thanks Sarah. Um, we had a production house because we wanted multimedia, I mean, really, to sit for a six hour module on open education and just be reading text, 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 and not be seeing what open education means in different situations, contexts, environments, realities, right? I think that's where we start to change people's minds and hearts and shift them from inactivity to some sort of exploration, hopefully engagement. These are some of the open ed influences across the last few years. Get them involved, add student voice. Why are we trying to speak to people from, I'm sorry, but some of us are very old <laughs> compared to the target market, you know? And we need to be speaking a language that students identify with, we think we know the language. Um, you know, just go on to TikTok. <laughs> Student contributions as makers, these, this, is, this was an open textbook ex, um, experience survey that we did at our university. And we found out that a third of our students, only a third were buying textbooks with that money coming from that funders. A lot of the others were making value judgments. Would we be eating, right? I, I, there's so many countries where this is real. So in our country, there's like so many opportunities for open education to be made a feature of education to cut costs so that that money could buy a laptop for a student, which could be preloaded with OER. They could get it before they come to the university and be prepared. No, what do we do? We let them come to the university. Two months later, they get the laptop. They still have to buy textbooks. The funding organization crashes. Student protests for the next three months. Ask Kerry, this is a reality in South Africa every single semester. Every single semester, I have to sometimes like be scared to go to work because I will be stoned in my car trying to get onto campus because students are saying, this is enough. And it is, and yet, what are we doing? We're still making them buy textbooks. So student contributions, you see the brainstorming, sourcing open content, multimedia creation, practical research, there's an example, developing a structure for the course. The students helped us make that structure. They helped us set up the modules, script writing. So here's great content creation, right? This is experience, development, but also like an actual portfolio that you're walking out of here with and it's published and your name is on there, how's that for your CV, right? Not saying I can write a script, showing the script, showing the actual end product, and then collaborating online, both locally and internationally. We've won some awards, hey, Chrissy. Um, so this was a book that we did. Uh, it was one of the Goji in fellowships, right? That Professor Chrissy Naranzi um, was awarded a few years ago. We worked through COVID on this and Lots of this happened. So lots of awards, lots of acknowledgements. We translated together into how many languages now, Chrissy? A lot, 30 or something. Russian, Swahili, Zulu, English, Afrikaans, um, like you have to go out. If anyone is interested in making another language version of the book, speak to Chrissy and I, we are here. Um, individual awards, that was nice. There's progress updates. There's more events that we've had. This was our last event two weeks ago, exploring artificial intelligence in higher education and what openness does in that space. Opportunities for you to get involved and now I'm going fast, okay? If you're in South Africa, Kerry, Tabisa, um, CILT, Glenda, them are involved in the OER work stream. So we've got a funding organization that's looking at engaging with all of the universities in South Africa. We've so far got 21 of the 24 institutions on board, right? We've given three workshops. Now, the third workshop is next week when I'm presenting about that at OE Global. If anyone's a librarian, knows librarians, um, our university is looking for input for developing a repository, uh, for developing the policies for OER. 
reach out to me, please. Um, I'm, I'm literally here looking for resources to support that activity. Open education for a better world. So this is UNESCO based. Um, it's at the University of Nova Gorica in Vipava, Slovenia. And I am the Africa Hub coordinator for the last three years now. And before that, I was a project author with becoming an open education influencer. Then I was a mentor. So open education for a better world is a course development, a course creation initiative in open education for educators from across the world. We connect you with a mentor in another country. Um, we have support, we have events. And um, there for developers, if you are interested in looking, the QR code is there. If you are a potential mentor who has a lot to offer, right? And people in this room, you have a lot to offer. Openness means sharing, right? This is a great vehicle. And also there might just be a trip to Slovenia at some point. As you can see, it's all based in the UNESCO Sustainable Development Goals. So each course specifically targets one of those and not just education, we're talking about from script writing to uh, chemistry to whatever, right? Calls for developers are now out. Uh, the deadline is the 9th of November, and we want to see people that will look at courses and artifacts that were created in OE for BW. So don't repeat something, use what we have done, right? Use the five R's and make something new or help someone make something new. The Knowledge Equity Network, I'm a key partner for the Knowledge Equity Network, which was started in Leeds at the University of Leeds last year, Chrissy. Yeah, Chrissy is the senior lead for um, the University of Leeds for the Knowledge Equity Network, which we shortened to Ken. And Ken is basically about putting a declaration out there and getting people to sign and to make commitments about how they will engage using open um, practices and uh, research. Thank you, Chrissy. Um, find out more. My, my plea here today is if you are in an institution, right? Don't sign up your institution without going to the higher ups and saying, because we're asking people to make an actual commitment. 70% of the research by 2030 would be published openly, for example, right? You don't have to have 70%. You can amend that commitment and say, well, maybe by 2035, we'll do 50%. So we're working towards something, but we are signatories to the Knowledge Equity Network, right? Which is going to help guide us and facilitate and support us towards that goal. Um, yeah, all of the information is there. For my side, just make your move in open um, or advocacy and use Bowie, like literally push it out there, push it out to students, push it to staff. You have people who are unaware of open education resources, just take them to the course, you know? Um, you can get a certificate of completion once you're done. We are trying to get it accredited at Nelson Mandela University as a short learning program. So it, it has course value. Right, because apparently free is less, free is bad. Um, you can use our support, use the content, spread open and make change real. We are hashtag open ed influencers on X, on Facebook, on Instagram. And we've got a ton of multimedia um, content that we made during lockdown. It's literally called the Made During Lockdown series. Uh, we have snippets or not snippets, but like actual uh, clips of traditional versus open um, textbooks and what students say, where you can go find them, how to use them, how to license them, lots and lots of content. And if you want any of that, if you want students to guide your students how to do that, our open it influences on our experience and able to do so. Thank you. Nelson Mandela University says change the world. Thanks.
they do a lot of their marking as well, because <laughs> I really dislike marking. For no, they don't love me for marking. <laughs> no, but the the idea is they learn while they're doing stuff. Then they're learning a lot more by correcting other people's mistakes. They have to explain the grammar as to why you're correcting this. So now they're sort of beating those rules into their own heads. So it's a really nice cycle that way. Um, for the writing, they get peer support. So they give each other ideas. They edit each other's text. Everything that comes out is much better because you know five or 10 heads have looked at it and thought how it would be better. Um, I've started using open assignments which means basically they get to decide what the assignment is. Uh, I've played around with open due dates because university, when you're taking five, six courses that are all scheduled on the same timetable, means you've got 20 essays due in one week, and that's just unfair. So I kind of tell them that any time before the end of the term would be great. Um, and most people don't abuse that. <laughs> there is the odd exception. Um, I've had them... Uh, well, I, I've worked with open curriculum where I have multiple assignments that are kind of done in parallel so they can decide which one they would like to prioritize, do which one first and second and third. So those are some of the consequences of being progressively more open as I've gotten older. And since I'm really old, I'm really open at this point. Um, and I guess that's going to be pretty much it. Um, hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be with you today. Um, my name is Sarah Hammersheim, and I'm an EdD candidate at Athabasca University. And this is my research topic, open pedagogy, OER, and enacted curriculum in K-12 classrooms. Um, I live in Denver, Colorado, and I just kind of wanted to start to take a moment to acknowledge that the land that I live in are the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, and Ute nations and people. And I just wanna recognize that these indigenous people are the original stewards of the land in which I live. Um, so in addition to being an EdD candidate, I am a teacher librarian in a middle school in one of Denver's suburbs. I've been teaching for 12 years and I've worked with students and teachers in kindergarten through eighth grade. Um, and I've also worked as a public librarian. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my research, including what has inspired me along the way. Um, I've always loved learning from not being able to stop reading books when I was a child and possibly as an adult to continually asking questions today to better understand others in our world. I consider myself a lifelong learner. I've been an elementary school teacher, public librarian and teacher librarian in a variety of locations with diverse communities. When I was in my fourth year of being a teacher librarian, I remember noticing that my kindergarten and first grade students, so five to seven year olds, were full of questions, but by the time they reached fourth grade, so about 10, they really had trouble formulating questions. They were much more comfortable answering questions than asking them. And I wondered why. They were thoughtful, creative, curious children with boundless energy and surprising creativity, but was school somehow squashing the questioning? This thinking led to a study of problem and inquiry-based learning and consideration of critical pedagogies and student-centered learning spaces. As part of my ed doctorate journey, I engaged in some action research, exploring ways that I as a teacher librarian could support the development of the 21st century skills of creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, and communication in these students. I sought out teacher partners who were open to fostering learning through using self-directed topics for students. And these are some of my fourth graders. Um, I noticed that these experiences prompted an excitement in students and a motivation to engage with learning in new ways. Many students in a variety of grades gradually approached being able to ask deeper questions. So this study led to my doctoral topic. And after I encountered Haggerty's eight attributes of open pedagogy in some of my doctorate reading, I noticed that many of these attributes were to be found in the engaging learning that happened in those student-centered spaces. So I began to wonder if conducting research on open pedagogy and OER use in K-12 education could support both teacher and student engagement in learning and foster the learning that today's world requires. 
So as it turns out, these thoughts and experiences are not new in the fields of education, learning science, and curriculum studies. Interestingly, although these fields are related and the conversations taking place within them are similar, these conversations are often relegated to the silos of each particular field. So I'm hoping that my research will build bridges between those fields. Um, in education, the educational discourse on the purpose and form of education in K-12 has been split between traditional or teacher-directed learning and progressive or more student-centered camps. And here are just some of the features of those. And similarly, in curriculum studies, the emerging conversations have been divided between the supporters of the more industrial Tyler rationale, which centers around objectives, learning experiences, and assessment, and the reconceptualists who view curriculum as an embodied and lived experience in addition to a course of study. And learning science is also contributing to the conversations as recent findings have illuminated that learning is social, computational and influenced by shared neural circuitry between perception and production of an action. So science is confirming that children learn best in social environments that are meaningful, active, iterative, and joyful. Well, concurrent with these discussions in K-12 education is the increasing value of and importance on equity, diversity, inclusion, access personalization, differentiation, and contextualization in order to better meet the needs of today's diverse learners. Due to open licensing and the five R's, OER may support these values and initiatives as OER provide access to updatable, high quality digital learning materials for everyone, no matter geography, economic status, or disability. Moreover, these learning materials can be adapted for cultural responsiveness and inclusivity, thus allowing for personalization. And through interacting with OER, K-12 teachers can contextualize content for their students and practice creativity and professionalism. And I just thought it was important to kind of go over a couple of definitions. Here's the one that I use for OER from UNESCO. And then when, oops, when it comes to open pedagogy, um, like many other terms preceded by open, there's a plethora of definitions. And academics and practitioners even use different terms to refer to similar experiences, including open educational practices, OER-enabled pedagogy, and even open education. So the research that I'm planning to do is um, using the, the model of Hegarty. And Hegarty's model suits K-12 education, as all of these eight attributes can be clearly seen in K-12 classrooms. And also Creative Commons licenses are not part of her definition, although they are essential for truly open pedagogy to exist. So the problem that my research will address is as follows. Um, although the goals, values, and often methods of K-12 education fit with those of open education, research has mostly addressed higher education settings. And research on OER and open pedagogy in K-12 spaces is limited, though growing. Moreover, research exploring the relationship, if any, between the use of OER and open pedagogy and enacted curriculum models is lacking. So the purpose of my study will be to examine the experiences of K-12 teachers as they use OER and open pedagogy as defined by Hagerty. And I'll be using the methodology of hermeneutic phenomenology as described by Van Manen. I will be interviewing K-12 teachers in Colorado and in Washington state with experience using open pedagogy. And I'll also be looking at some of the digital resources that they um, use or have created. And the goal will be to describe the essence of open pedagogy and OER used by teachers in K-12 classrooms and relate that essence to um, models of an active curriculum. And so, it, like I said before, in K-12 education, the language of curriculum is super prominent. And it might be a doorway for this group of educators to participate more fully in the open education conversation. And so, oops. So I have you know, my three research questions that I've been investigating or that I'm thinking of um, are centering around teacher experiences of open pedagogy, teacher experiences of using OER, and then what ways, if any, do those experiences align with um, the framework of teacher curriculum relationships described by Ramilliard? <clears throat> and I think this uh, research is significant um, because there's many gaps in the literature. First of all, research addressing OER and open pedagogy at the K-12 level is limited. 
And OER and open pedagogy may be perfectly positioned to address student needs, educational values, and learning science findings, but research is lacking. And additionally, research connecting open pedagogy and OER with curriculum studies is also lacking. So I'm hoping to address the gaps and provide insight into the K-12 teacher experience of an enactment of OER and open pedagogy. And, oh, questions. Hello, everybody. Um, everybody's really tired. I'm seeing yawning. If everybody, if you're able to, please stand and sit three times, <laughs> spin around twice, then take a big breath and sit. Just so, just get it flowing, get it going. We're almost done here. Thank you for hanging out. Yeah, and everybody online, you can do it if you're at home or if not, no big deal. So I'm Billy Mikey. Um, I work for UH Manoa. Um, a lot of you know me, I've done a lot of things for a number of years. Um, a lot of my work is on the practical end of things, helping people actually make OER and remix OER. Um, but the last few years, um, I've been a part of the political science department at UH Manoa, and I've been thinking about theory and philosophy and extending beyond our, our, our more common sort of frames of how we look at open education. Um, and so hopefully we're gonna get a little bit weird today. It'll be quick. Quick outline, a little bit about me. I won't spend too much time on that. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the problem that I think is worth researching. Um, I'll explain sort of a few things that I found in education or open education futures. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the study I'm proposing that I'll be doing. And then the last part is sort of con connecting the research that I'm thinking about doing to everybody else's research. And it's so good to see so much, so many new faces and folks that have been around a while, just sharing all their experiences and what they're looking at, because it's just kind of, I know I'm gonna be barely sleeping tonight just thinking about all the possibilities. So kind of cool, thanks for being here. Um, I'm Billy, I'm a dad, first and foremost. My son turns four on Friday, so I'm actually missing the conference. I'm gonna fly out on uh, Monday morning to see him. Um, I lead online program development at UH Manoa. Um, a small but important piece of that is OER publishing. We use Pressbooks. Pressbooks fanboy, all right. Um, I also do a lot of traditional course design with programs I wanna take their academic certificates and degrees online. I help them do that in a smart, concerted, strategic way. Um, I worked for Creative Commons for a few years, um, 2012, 2015, and 2016, I went back to the University of Hawaii. Um, and again, I'm in political science department um, and there was no treaty. Hawaii was stolen land, is stolen land. So food for thought. Okay, then uh, what are we actually doing here? Uh, OER 19, I gave an interesting presentation that kind of had a lot of people starting conversations with me about what are you talking about, right? Um, here are a few little frame, frame grabs and animated GIFs from the presentation. Essentially, um, I was looking at philosophies of technology and um, I, through reading a number of things, um, I started to realize that the question of open might not be, question of open education might not be a question of openness. It might be other kinds of questions in a similar way to thinking about technology. And Heidegger famously said that the question of technology might not actually be a technological question. We have to think kind of outside of that. So the problem I'm seeing is that sort of, and don't take this in a bad way, but as a field as open education, as researchers, we're not really imagining the futures that we want for collaborative scholarship and open education in a way that is actionable and, and measurable and, hey, let's go somewhere, how are we gonna get there? And that's, that's the focus of my research. Um, so the questions, I wish I could read this, darn. Um, so main question, what are the greatest barriers to scholarly collaboration um, among open education micro-publishers? Micro-publishers, I consider myself a micro-publisher. Um, we have a university press that I don't work with. I work with our IT department and my internal unit to publish open textbooks. And I know there are a number of other higher ed institutions in the US primarily that do this too. Um, and so I'm gonna be focusing on them, trying to look at what are the barriers, what are they running up against? What are they trying to do that they can't do? And what are the barriers in the way? Um, I'm gonna be focusing on trends and choice points along the way in the open education movement, as it were, um, trying to figure out how to disentangle those and, and sort of suss them out. And then I'm also thinking, and I'd like you to think on this too, the third question, if you're thinking about the future, what values or morals or connections 
would you want to take into any future for open education? If things are radically different, what would you want to be the same? So why the future? Um, we're already doing it, whether or not we talk about it very much. Um, Audrey Waters, famously, I love her critiques. It's really sad she stepped out of the open education movement a little while ago, but her work is still highly relevant. Um, and so, I mean, the best way to predict the future is to issue a press release. She talked a lot about the interplay between industry and technology and how much we rely on VC, venture capital backed startup firms, or we used to do more um, to determine where we're going as opposed to figuring out what kind of future we want for ourselves, regardless of where the money is flowing. Um, she also did a really good job year after year. She looked at the Horizon Report and the issued trends on like where or where online education is going more generally. Um, she found that there are a lot of overlaps and sort of repeating themes. Um, she stopped in 2015 and 2016. She wrote a post saying she wasn't going to do it anymore. I went back and I was like, hey, for this presentation, I'm going to continue. I'm going to go look at the Horizon Reports and kind of build them out year by year beyond that. And what I realized is that in 2020, they stopped issuing six trends. And instead, they started doing futures. And I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. And then I was like, oh, shit, sorry. Um, <laughs> Every doc student apparently have heard, when you're putting together your research project, you inevitably, inevitably find another project that is already did what you're trying to do. And I was like, oh, okay, this is not a researcher. This was Educause putting out a report, but at the same time, looking at how they structured their look at the future, it's actually kind of similar to how I'm looking at doing this research project. Um, if you look on the left-hand side, they have um, essentially five buckets, social, technological, economic, higher ed, they really just kind of bolted on there, and then political. Um, and then the four futures, which are pretty common, it was kind of odd that they didn't actually cite Jim Dater who, who founded these futures, but the four futures are growth, constraint, collapse, and transformation. And that's what I look like when I saw this. <laughs> um, that's Jim Dater, really odd guy, emeritus professor in my department, super cool, very forward thinking. Um, and so the four futures, Continued growth, basically things stay as is and we continue on a trajectory the way we're going. Collapse, we sort of like, we spend all our coins and we fall off the edge of a cliff. Discipline, we figure out, hey, we're gonna fall off this cliff, let's pump the brakes, slow down a little bit and figure something else out. And then transformation where we, where aliens give us some technology or we make some discovery that's gonna help us just get out, right? Um, Larry Lessig, who was one of the founders of Creative Commons, he wrote, this is the Chicago New School, um, he wrote about four different flavors of barriers to open, which is, again, what I'm basing my research on. Um, the market, which is financial, essentially, um, basically law, law <laughs> legal constraints or barriers, social, financial, and architecture, um, law, finance, social, shoot, going blank here legal, financial, social, technical, essentially to architecture is technical. So these different flavors of barriers that might be in the way of people working together. And so I'm like, hey, those are four fairly easily looked at different buckets that you might put different barriers into. Again, if you look at the Horizon Report, they actually bolted on higher education, which doesn't really align. It's not the same kind of, of category. Um, and essentially, this is what I'm looking at. And so if you take, um, technical, legal, social, and financial barriers and drivers. These are the buckets I'm gonna be looking to put different trends and phenomena and events and choice points into um, so that people can kind of sort out. It's not like, hey, we're open education and we're just vaguely heading in one direction, let's go. But in a more concerted way, what are the technical barriers to this kind of work? What are the legal barriers? Obviously, Creative Commons licenses, open licensing really help us get through, they, they lower barriers. In a social way, you know, we have things that support people working together or not. In a lot of uh, subject areas, you have folks that are competitively publishing against each other and not publishing openly because they don't want to get scooped or don't want to get their tenure put at risk because someone else published their work. Um, and then financial, we're seeing all kinds of crazy things happen with late stage capitalism. I don't think it's a healthy place to be going, um, but that's where we're going anyway. So essentially this is a rough draft of dropping things in. Um, the barriers and drivers to collaboration. Um, I spoke with Lisa Petrides, the founder um, of ISKME, the Institute for, Solid, for Institute for Knowledge Management and Education. I've known her for a number of years. Um, and I was telling her about this PhD project. She said, hey, 
this events or phenomenons or trends you're talking about sounds kind of like this thing I already talked about, which is choice points. And so if you look over here, um, this is just one slide from a presentation a couple years ago at the uh, Michigan OER Summit. Um, essentially, she pointed to different kinds of trends or actions or parts of open education, like open licensing, open source being a part of that, um, sustainable business models, interoperability, open textbooks as different kinds of things that we might place into these buckets. I'm not trying to build out a comprehensive history of the open education movement. I think people have already done that to some extent. I don't think that's a worthwhile project for me, but I think it's worth worthwhile to understand sort of how we got to where we are so that we can in an informed way work forward. Um, similarly, other folks have tried to figure out or tried to put some boundaries around like what is openness? And so if you see over here, those four buckets appear again, social, technical, legal, financial. And so in some way, a lot of people are already thinking in these categories, how do we go further with it? Um, Doug Levin, when I talked to him a few years ago, he said, hey, I've done a little bit of scenario planning. I've done a little bit of futures work. And I was like, hey, that's awesome because not a lot of people are. Um, and so um, I read his work and in terms of like trends or choice points um, or focus areas for potential futures, he looked at production, content creation, search and discovery, which has been an ongoing problem, um, retainment and organization, use using pedagogical supports, um, feedback and vision, dissemination and distribution. And he sort of cast out what different futures might be. So there is some literature, um, not a ton, and I'm looking for more. So if you have ideas, please let me know. Um, and again, we're doing, and I think it's important work to keep doing because we're not doing it perfectly, um, but I think we need to look beyond sort of the traditional like open questions um, and sort of take a, a more critical approach to what open education might be down the line because we have a tendency to sort of look at what's in front of our noses and not think five or 10 years down the line. And I think that we can, no one's gonna tell the future, that's not possible, but we can sort of brainstorm and ideate as a group individually where we would like to be and then in an informed way work backwards to where we are so that even if we don't get there in the time frame we're looking at, we can know, are we off course, course correct? Are we stumbling on things we weren't prepared for? Outliers, things like that. Like nobody knew that X or Twitter was going to become what it is. Nobody knew that Donald Trump was going to win the election. Nobody knew these things. There are outlier moments and in future studies, you expect to not expect those kinds of things, but when they happen, you pivot and you sort of look at things differently. One small note about Twitter, Twitter was such an awesome place to connect around open education and it's really tragic how it's really been shattered. I am on Mastodon um, and I'll continue to be active on there, but Twitter is just sort of a dumpster fire at this point. So the study I'm looking at doing, this is not refined. I'm hoping to work with, with Rob and Martin and Beck over the next couple of days to refine this. Essentially, I'm looking at a Delphi study um, with an interpretist, interpretivist and construction, constructivist uh, sort of aim, a survey of other OER micro publishers similar to my own unit in higher education to identify what those barriers are and what the opportunities are and sort of to look at sorting them into the buckets. Um, I'll be doing targeted interviews based on what feedback I get and then potentially do a second round of interviews. And then as a second part of the study, it would be scenario building. And that's, that's the future's work um, to sort of very closely look at these trends and then construct what the alternative futures might be. Um, and again, to look past our own noses. Not that there's anything wrong with it because we really need to be focused on what is the present. The present is the only time you can actually affect. You can't affect the future, at least not yet. The past is already done. And so right now is, is what we should, be, we should be looking at, at the same time, also be considering the future. Um, my, the chair of my committee, Kathy Ferguson, um, she's a futurist, feminist, um, political theorist. She's awesome. And this stuck, stuck with me from the first conversation I had with her. She said that things move before they can be articulated. I think that's important work to be doing because it happens to all of us looking at the open education landscape like whoa that's kind of going in that direction or this is looking different i'm not sure what i'm looking at things change they move before you can describe them and so giving a name to what you're looking at is super super important so the current stage 
just, just this is not like formal at all. Um, I'm I'm drafting my prospectus right now. I'm going to be writing and revising that, um, and then I do all defend my prospectus probably in spring. Um, I'll be preparing for my comprehensive exams, and once the once I pass those, hopefully I'll be writing, 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 and then revising, 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 and trying to stay alive, and then defending probably in a, a year and a half. And so for the purposes of of this presentation and my time here. Um, I'm just spending time trying to discover related or connected scholarship that I might not have heard about. I have, I have a, an awesome Zotero library that didn't make sense to throw up here, but I have a lot of things sort of stored and, and cataloged already, but I'm sure there's more out there. Um, again, the method and the, and the approach is super, super important. And so I'm hoping to refine that and get that sort of nailed down this weekend. Um, and then just letting the net work because that's why we're here. It's, it's been crazy the last, couple of years, deep COVID, not having the social interactions that we used to have. And so it's really cool to be in the room with y'all. Um, another person on my committee, Debbie Halbert, who is, she's done future studies. She's actually taken a feminist approach to intellectual property research and it's fascinating work, um, but specific to future, she said, futures can open our eyes to how we colonize the future with assumptions about linearity and inevitability and help us decolonize the future by opening up alternatives. And I think it's totally a direction to be looking. And that's mostly it. So thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, I think mine is the easiest. <laughs> And uh, I, I urge you to be part of it, and uh, we will do this together. Uh, I'll move to. Uh, well, I'll ask you maybe just two, please. What do you see in this in, in this slide, or what does what can you make of this slide? <laughs> Good one. Somebody else. This slide. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> I like that. Somebody else. This slide is all alone. A last one. Something I'm waiting. Unless you say it, I'll not move. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. And how about this? Now bring the picture of your PhD study. For those who have done that, the journey that we've gone through. How about this? Uh -huh. Very good. Somebody else? A second one, then I proceed. Uh -huh. On the shoulders of others. Very true. And that's good, Jan. And the last one? Something? Together. Something else again? Yes, we are celebrating. We are celebrating. Yes. Thank you very much, friends. So I'll go back here. Then I'm going to give you um, a true picture of how my journey has been uh, since way back when I was zero years old to until 2010 when I, I went, uh, I met Professor Fred Mulder. Then the journey with GoGN. And then after graduation, what followed was the fellowship from the GoGN network. And then the who me, who is Dr. Judith Betten. I think it's a beautiful story, don't you think so? <laughs> okay, now, um, this for me is, uh, this morning when you talk about the metaphors, it's like I felt you talk about me. <laughs> and the reality of what I saw on each and every presentation table was talking about how we sometimes, especially from the global north, journey or move through waves to be who we are today, which is a beautiful story. And very nice once you get to a level where I am. But before then, you are lost, you're in a wonderland. You are lost, you're in a danger zone. You are approaching or you are faced with a lot of poisonous mushrooms that you are asking yourself, should I eat or should I have hope to wait? Maybe food will come tomorrow. And that is the wonderland that we find ourselves in. And especially a scenario of a girl from a poor village or a poor, uh, a poor family with aspires to pursue education 
but lacks that financial means that can deeply be challenging and quite emotional. And that is the practical picture that I want to portray here today. So in my wonderland, I had ambition and hope that the only way that I will be able to transform and bring change circumstances in my family was through education. So the desire was to do a drive education. And if I get this education, then I'll be able to have a better future. In the mayhem of limited, limited resources, where you could hardly find you know, the basic human needs like food, clothing, of course, shelter, and the cost of education is so high, you don't talk about school fees here, you're looking for free things where you can be able to maneuver yourself to find something that is called education. And indeed, uniform is even a problem. You wear one uniform for almost five or six years with so many packets here and there, but you're just happy because that is what is happening in your, in your environment. And indeed, uh, you sometimes seem insurmountable, but life has to continue because you have hope and the desire that only education will transform this life. Pressure to contribute to the family. You know, you have a look around and you're like, hey, there are young ones who are behind me, they need to eat. My mother is struggling as a widow, but it's not easy with nine children, I'm the seventh one. So there are many things that come up and still in the wonderland, you're talking about gender disparities. Uh, you are quite young, 11 years old, but the men around you see, look at you at the beautiful and the best fourth or fifth, fifth wife, you know, gender disparities. There's no need for you to go to school because it's not important for the family or for the community. What is best then was the fact that you can be able to give your mother who is struggling some few, three, four cows so that they can be able to survive, sell the cows, celebrate with the uncles and the brothers or so that they can be able also to have their wives proceed. The wonderland. Then long journeys, depending on where you are uh, uh, getting your education, uh, in this wonderland, we, we walk so many dis distances to acquire basic education, that's primary level. And you take this long and audio journeys with the hope that someday education will transform your life. Something good is coming and the desire and the resilience and the patience that you have that only through education, something is going to come to. The fear of discrimination. Sometimes you move into those classes, teachers look at you differently because they think you should be providing for your family through getting married as a fourth or fifth wife. And then this basically gives you, it makes you very fear and kills your self-confidence in many ways in a sense of feeling that I don't really belong. But you're like, mm -mm, it's only through education that I'm going to transform my life. Resilience and determination is very key. Despite these challenges, I felt that uh, I needed to display remarkable resilience and determination to ensure that I get the hope and the determination to have my education so that I can be able to meet the needs of my personal growth and also of my family. And then we don't get tired to get there. So, um, Later on, you meet friends with mixed emotions and mixed reactions. Dreams are breaking the cycles, but by the end of the day, something must happen. So 2010, I meet Fred Mulder. May he rest in peace. Then I explained to him the cause and the journey that I've had to a level where now I had graduated with my masters. I'm off that wonderland. I'm moving on from the danger zone to a zone where I'm getting shoulders. And the first shoulder that I land on was the one for Fred Mulder. And I tell him my story is like, this is beautiful. Go and put it down in one page. I go back home in May, 2010, a story of almost five books in one page, how? So I tried three pages. When I sent him the three pages, he brought it down to one page and said, now can I share this? Then something can come out of it. And the something that came out of it when I got the response is the fact that there was a program, a project called raw for d that will uh, be able to help in finding out the fair view of OER that will help me to clear the dream or remake the dream of um, enhancing quality education to the women or the girls in the village freely and openly. 
So Rock of D comes on board, and then what happens? GoGN is formed. 2013, I get registered as a PhD student at the Open University, and the journey starts. So through the GoGN network, what happens? There are a number of points that I want to raise and very fast, access to diverse expertise, which exposed me to a number of a whole range of experts and researchers and scholars from different backgrounds and disciplines. And I think most of them are in this room. And the diversity provided fresh perspectives on my research and therefore enriched the levels of my, my research, not just but the research, but even in terms of language, you know, the language could be a barrier and a big barrier. English is our fourth language. So you struggle to learn the language, understand how it is done, and more importantly, the different perspectives of education systems in Africa and the one that I was facing in Netherlands. So it was beautiful for me because I was learning every single morning. International exposure, very important uh, with the Gojian uh, uh, network. Mentorship and guidance, of course. Gojian is a global network that really connects students, especially those who are doing their PhDs, with experienced researchers who provide mentorship and guidance. And this is very crucial at any level of your study. And normally I ask this question, those who have not joined Gojian, how do they expect actually to graduate with their PhDs? So advice on research strategies, career development, and navigating the academic landscape landscape so that can be able also to get the quality of education that can help and enhance you. Finally, access to data and field work, very crucial. Facilitation of quite a number of access to local resources and contacts and networks that sometimes I smile myself because I'm, I'm like, I'm navigating through uh, my local customs to international levels where great things are happening. And indeed, the reason why I came here is through GoGN network when I met my great friend Jenny in one of the GoGN conferences and seminars. And career opportunities. So GoGN is a beautiful network. Now, the darkest moment came in before I graduated when uh, Professor uh, Mulder uh, passed on. Let him rest in peace. But not really when this happened. It's when he broke the news about his health, which we don't do, uh, in Africa we don't talk about and giving you, you know, trying to prepare me on how soon things could be. That was really the darkest moment in my life. And I was so close to finalizing uh, uh, and graduating with my PhD. I did not know what to, what to do. It was so dark, but by the end of the tunnel, when I met great minds within the Gojian, things came back to line. When I got emails from several of you here in, in, the, in the room, uh, just to mention a few, uh, Martin Weller, Christine, Bear, Cronin, Kuhn, Beck, all the time, Natalie, finding out how are you doing, where are you, where can I help, can you talk to me, that was really, that was really encouraging. And you find a lot of shoulders to guide you to make sure that you finish and achieve the dream that I had from the Wonderland. And I think that is basically what happened. Now, graduation comes in after one year when I was given a new professor. And the team that joined there, one of them, I'm very happy to mention here, that's Professor uh, Robert Shure was part of the team that was in my graduation and in my defense. And uh, Professor Harman helped very much together with Professor Jose Dutra from uh, uh, Brazil. Yos Rikas was in the team indeed. Now on the graduation date, Gojian was in the hall. Dr. Bear, she's there. <laughs> Catherine Cronin, Caroline Kuhn, all the way from wherever they were, they came to give me the final support on my PhD defense. And this is really a journey that I will never forget. And I'll talk about this with a lot of vigor. After graduation 2019, the team that were from the UK gave me a fellowship to raise the profile of the GoGN network in the Global South. And the main role ideally was to recruit new members from the Global South to also form part of the beautiful GoGN network. COVID stroke, I managed to bring in on board. I tried my level best. I know Stan is one, one of my recruits. Stan, unfortunately, was not able to make it here, but I was very proud of that because uh, many people reached out to quite a number so I could be able also to enhance the African chapter of day, uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Then after the graduation, Many things has happened in my life. 
There was an award that was the best, um, there was the researcher of the year, 2021, 2022, because of Goji, and please clap for that, it's important for yourselves. Then this year in August, senior lecturer position, which is very difficult and hard for any woman in my institution. And at my age, people keep asking questions, is it real, is it true? But it's because of the network that I am in that gives me a lot of passion to keep doing what I do and I do it best. Then the African coordinator for the program on service learning integration of theory, faith and, and practice, community practice. I am the global, I mean, I'm the regional coordinator for that. So what next for Gojian? My plea is we need to find funders for this program. And this network holds a great promise driven by ongoing advancement in technology. And this shift of the academic landscape is giving us a lot of hope with such a network that will help many people from my region who, who uh, otherwise would not even gotten to where I am, I am today. So my prayer and my hope is that we need to do something. And I challenge the Gojian uh, alumni in this room today and those who are you know, to make it. How are we going to support and enhance the sustainability of this network. I want to see Gojian in the next 20, 40 years to come. I want my great grandchildren to be part and parcel of Gojian. And this is the dream I have for Gojian. Ladies and gentlemen, I think we need to start small. And regional chapters that uh, uh, Professor Shua talked about is one way in which we can also try to escalate this good news across the globe. My name is Dr. Judith Pete. I'm so proud to be called a doctor because it is because of what you do, what this network does, the mentorship some of us get from the leadership in the Open University in the UK is amazing. We are learning from them. You are mentoring some of us on leadership on such global networks. And it's my pride that someday we shall also give back to this network what is countable, what is measurable, so that the feeling that I have can also be extended to others out there. Thank you.